Good evening. Are these going to dim a little bit, or, or is this the way they are? It's, it's very bright, um, unlike me. Um, okay, devices off, uh, please. Thank you. Um, I'm Stephen Yenser from the Department of English, and this affair uh, is the first of the Hammer Poetry Readings this year. Um, this is the 50th year, actually it might be the 51st year um, of the series, which began all, all these decades ago at Sunset Canyon Recreation Center and came here shortly after this uh, indispensable museum opened. We have seven readings this year and about midway through uh, we'll have a semi, have a small semi-centennial celebration. So um, stay in touch. Uh, our generous sponsors are still, as, uh, as from the beginning, the Office of Cultural and Recreational Affairs, uh, the Department of English, and of course the Hammer, uh, especially the Public Programs Division under the steady hand of uh, Claudia Bester. Jana Perkrell. This will be the first time that I've heard her read, and I've been looking forward to it in a special way uh, because there is a sense in which her poems, captivating as they are, resist her, I think, and resist us uh, at every step. Uh, poems by nature, of course, move in time, and in this respect, they differ radically from painting and from another art that Jana is a connoisseur of, um, photography, uh, the, the spatial arts rather than temporal, their products stand still. The temporal dimension is a great advantage for poetry, of course, as it is for music, yet that advantage has its countervailing principle. Not only can good poems not be simply read, but must be reread uh, to be read. Moreover, their movement has to be stopped to be appreciated. And everything about Jana's verse, which fiercely urges us forward toward precise meaning, simultaneously demands that we give pause um, in order to I guess to, to gather our, our wits, uh, as we say, and to, uh, and to savor, but, but also to construe. It's a very heady verse in all senses of that word, and it puts us in a bind, uh, which is why I think that reading it aloud is a courageous undertaking. Meanwhile, these, these two demands proceeding and delaying comport well, it seems to me, with the central subject of her new volume, New York City, which so often hurries, hurries us on, even as it insists that we stop and look at the remarkable particulars. Her poems, for their part, incorporate this paradox by several means, including unusual diction, uh, especially subtle puns, which are teased into focus, or rather into sharp double focus, by canny lineation, often unmetrical, which breaks against syntax in order to point up lexical ambiguity. The syntax itself can be hard. Uh, it's unique. Uh, though it probably owes something to that other quite different New York-oriented poet, John Ashbery, in its angular fragmentation. And it is also sometimes uh, slithery, serpentine slippery. The sentences get away from us. The poet exerts such pressure on them until we ourselves have to bear down and stop them at which point they often turn out to be Delphic. One vivid instance, which comes from what well, I think we must call an intermittent series of poems, all named Sybil, 
finally comes to rest this way. No knowledge in sa is safety. I'm sorry, I blew that. No knowledge is safety. Even the resting point keeps escaping. Knowledge cannot save us, we, we understand, at the same, and at the same time, safety is knowing nothing. Another poem, entitled Waves, like six others in the book, No Matter, that's the name of the book, where every word matters, concludes thus, the girls I know look long and hard, make lists to do, two columns, pros and cons. Rereading, we see that long and hard are adjectives for the girls, as well as for the way they look. That is to say, they look and look. And the uh, pros and cons are not only qualities for and against a proposition, for example, but also agents in a transaction, pros and cons, a proposition, say. How to handle such counterpointing in a linear delivery? And the, these examples that I've given you are among the least complex, since word order offers so many opportunities to be relentlessly attentive if you're a superb syntactician, as she is, and someone who has much on our mind. But we're going to hear how uh, that can work after all. And afterward, uh, you can buy the book, which is on sale at the, at the back, and reflect uh, on things in it to your hearts and to your heads content. Jenna Prickrell. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, that was a wonderful reading. And I confess, you, <laughs> you revealed things to me in the poems that I hadn't consciously been aware of myself. Is this sound all right? Do I sound OK? Everybody hear me? Um, I'm going to read almost entirely from the new book, with one exception, I think, tonight. And I'll start with one of those poems. Um, that Stephen mentioned called Waves. Um, there, are, there are several, intermittent series is actually a great term for them. They're not quite sequences, but there are six or seven series of poems in the book um, have the same titles, and Waves is one of them. I was thinking of reading this first because it starts on an airplane, and I'm terrified of flying, um, but it's been so lovely to be here today. Um, so it really felt like it was worth getting on an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> to get to these palm trees and heat. Waves. True little waves from high above in a window seat, so few of you have enough of yourselves to fold over onto, forming a dress you wear out instantly. The most part of you is continuous skin with its own living texture curving over the bottom, a bone. Though often enough, on land, it appears you're falling all over yourselves to be tallest. Each of you, prim threat of drowning, should I contemplate a swim. The window seat is just a way of taking in the danger all at once, breathing the ultimatum in and trying to breathe it back out at decent intervals. The next poem is, um, I discovered, I sort of realized belatedly something of a linchpin, I think, for the whole collection. Um, it starts out with my arrival in New York 16 years ago for grad school, um, where I went to study with the writer and critic Ellen Willis at NYU. And this is something of an elegy for her as well. Um, I studied with her just not too long before she died in 2006. It's called Ambitious. Ambitious, yes, likely story again takes me in. Full ride, 
comically uninformed. Though I got St. Mark's had long performed itself, that little tea shop named after a Stones song, a guy explained it to me. I'd frequent and pour my calories into making rent, but never really talk with Ellen before she died. Her silence, absolute, thrust my polite papering over my silence into choking high altitude. But when I went to work for Bob, she said distinctly, there are things on earth besides, what was her term? Policy papers. That might not have been her term. Cut short. The city's gone. Simulacrum. Little York. Every great city leaves a little city in its wake. Even Troy had it done to it. And the hero, as he passed through, most complimentary, his way of nodding to solidarity. That's how he'd press renewal out of those migrants of his. And something like this, too, was her philosophy, but I am forced to pour it out. Her half of tea would be to sit in silence, undaunted words for paragraphs, although I hear she had friends, too, friends she spoke to, well knowing it's no use telling some things. They need situation, so much situation. The slant of land, tiny, far-off crenellations. The need's so great they build a little Troy, like I keep trying to tell you. I moved here because he meant to. It tumbles out, slope or no, as when, no telling what you'd be without the one born before you. Um, since there was a little bit of the Aeneid in that one, I thought I'd go on to another one with a bit of the Aeneid in it. It's called Insta, as in Instagram, if you'll forgive me. <laughs> and do you suppose if there had been phones that Dido would have chilled, monitored his posts as he sailed into a storm, the photos parading purple cumulonimbus and a zone of tender green oxygen above the horizon? all backlit deluxe with abundant cash and unspent prestige of masculinity when he demurred and beelined back to Sicily for yet another game. And settling in to hate read his captions and text them to Anna, she'd not forgive him, obviously, but regroup, restock her selfies, renovate her city for posting in Panorama. Um, in a way, the book is sort of strung between two elegies, and the second one is for my old, bo my old boss, Robert Silvers. I almost said my old Bob. <laughs> uh, who died two years ago now. It's called Bob. I think he found relief, a kind of carnival, only in the tunnels he forced, as with his body, in the replies to questions he'd shipped by overnight. This also explains why he swam laps. Master of the deferential, intricate refusal, lifetime ban on anyone once deemed faulty, wetting his wrath on the failure to secure a seat on the aisle for that night. And then he says, yes, yes, with a naughty smile, accepting the lesser thing and raving about it, because when he accepts it, it's different. Rubs out the sub's query and rewrites it in his hand, his pencil. Pencils sharpened a fistful at a time by some sub-sub. Walks in and quietly, melodically says to himself, any little news or calls or things today or no one gives a fuck. He bares his teeth, enunciates, and bugs his eyes to be charming. You're all moving manuscripts around my desk and I feel like Ingrid Bergman in that film. What was it? Gaslight! <laughs> and because he's a tyrant, I dry my eyes while laughing. It's an uncomfortable fact. For whom? that those who went to certain schools sooner found ways to resist him or stop resisting. The time it took me to see I'd never bring him round to my view of metaphors telling. And then I proceeded to pledge 30 more years to his archive. 
Please understand, in tribute to him, I mean that literally. When every man of letters was toppling, I thought this gives him never dreaming of that kind of thing, yet another eccentricity. Did he have material of his own, I wondered, early on, as if originality were invention, as if it weren't some precision of knowledge and morality applied to matters of substance, which, among friends, we call taste. Not that that excused my blinking when he cut those talking in his vicinity. He cut out small talk, not hearing it, convincingly deaf to its nothing, although I suspected he took in every word and filed it. Romanticism, too, he consumed in its totality, knowing just what it was he demolished, as all the modernists did. It being no accident his seeing what was coming before going, did he regret his own undoing any little thing? Listen, he would start when driven once again to issue a rebuke. Listen, I'd stiffen, listen. This is a poem called Asylum, which um, people find this hard to believe for some reason, but it begins with a very factual, non-fictional um, thing that I do when I have insomnia. <laughs> and it sometimes works, uh, which is that I repeat the definite article to myself in my head. A friend once told me that this would work, and occasionally it does. Asylum. Like, when I can't sleep, I say to myself, the, 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 the. Each article drenched to the bone in the belief it attends something solid, fond belief, always being cut in on the, 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 the. The, does the trick if I can stick with it, not get swept into narrative, that shock brigade, all tell if by shock they mean hit. The, 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 the papers say asylum is temporary now, true. What's not that's able to maintain its potency? You wake up from a spell in that genre of safety, relative safety. What saved you making as if the story were widely shared until you saw them as if otherwise, and then what saved you was seeing their look, saying, resemblance too may be at any time revoked, so must be made the most of. Seeing it then, seizing the minute, dismounting with the foot trained as a dancer to keep you traveling because they'd slept and refreshed, moved the, 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 the papers expired. It's their turn now to really live. This is another one of those intermittent series poems. It's called Stoic. Upper East Side's where you want to cultivate friends. Its mediocre restaurants won't close or send the delivery guys home on their bikes with the hand muffs, giant paper mache ear horns, no use against hurricanes. You hear them coming but can't endure them. In this city, friendship's the main mode of disaster prep. Basements and sub-basements busy with boilers switching on and off, inflicting real wear and tear on just the effort of getting in touch with those you don't want to lose touch with yet. I never saw the guys draw their bikes through the subway's emergency doors, so they must steer those ear horns deep into the outer burrows to sleep a few hours before pedaling back to one of the 10 or 12 downtowns to do it over. Those the zips real friends should have, and to be real, be necessary. Everyone has the one or two friends from back then whose points can afford to equal zero, though not perhaps without some penalty being inflicted all the time. 
Nobody needs more like you. So then I found it in myself because I had to, the one or two things that make it endurable here. And what they boil down to is indifference. This is the first of the waves poems um, in the book. Waves on the Hudson, just a few inches above the crown of my head. It's fall, but the leaves as green as the afternoon's humid. They fall from the trees, a half-hearted yellow, unswayed by the unforthcoming change. How you crossed that island, I don't know. One of the blasts must have nudged you. The Hudson is a river, though, with genuine water going one way most of the time, a true expression. Not much else here of the city I knew. The dog roll place, a place you pray to be delivered from through not too much exertion of your own. I designate the gondola to Hog Island, my second home. May I get carried away in perpetuity. Deliver me as down along a zip line, these piles, these ornate cornices, best seen, if not in enlargements of scenes, of Myrna Loy's Christmas Eve between martinis then through the blinds of function rooms where hopefuls in colorless uniforms circulate edible miniatures, even if the view going down differs from the view going up. The city welcomes you. The cathedral, perhaps, its smoking dome still visible over the charred fastnesses of village and East Village, still visible when I turn. And here we reach the shores of speculation. Um, and only because Myrna Loy appears in that poem <laughs> in one, from one of the Thin Man movies, um, I'm going to revert for one poem to uh, the after party. Also because we're in LA, and so I'm contractually obligated to read my poem about Buster Keaton. The, First and most recent, last time I was in LA um, was 12 years ago, and I came basically solely for the purpose of um, stalking the various sites of relevance to his life. <laughs> it's called Ode slash Our Hospitality. You who found none of your co-directors sufficiently serious, the scene in need of reshooting, the civil war, plantation mood, the trouble was to lay the keel down near enough to fact, to send those uncommon orders of feeling from your eyes to none but ours when a gun went off at dinner, I mean a popped cork, and you unmurdered, alive in the sense that projectors stutter, stern black pages to light you into motion for our no less than physical pleasure. Your gaze like an open hand, your glutes, your hurricane tending by its own momentum to the next exposure of an inner mechanism whose parody sinks its point into the mark to such a depth it spreads to illumine the entire body and every other body and the number of you in all the parts seem a sort of human finale, if not the very last absolutely necessary movie, then the first and last. We'll sit you in a chair and grant you days of banqueting in safety to think of new material. Another intermittent series in the book is called Friend, and this is the first of those. It's, uh, it's written in the form of a sonnet, and each line is one complete sentence of 12 syllables. Friend. I said the wrong thing again, but really meant it. Her greatness threw me and maybe knew what I meant. Benevolence of eminence, I'm testing you. You may not know when you are being tested. You're on your own to make the miracles ensue. Nowhere is protagonism so supported. She's also alone, but it's not her first event. Are you more alone when you have experience? 
Her mouth cues up the taste of that covetousness. It leads to nothing else than what it started as. It's criticism of books, not art or music. She's still the harshest judge of her own sentences. She shelters in my character analysis. She gets me in a side hug till I'm homesick. This is called fit. It's the magnetic nearness to centers of power that makes nearness a kind of sameness and sends the needles haywire or deal to just find a good tailor. That Russian lady without a huge amount of tact knew what to do with a velvet dress the color of fire bought on consignment and the handsome Algerian near Tompkins Square all hands-off deference carved, a linen dress three sizes too big to just my shapes and knobs. And then I sent my boyfriend there with a Hugo Boss suit equally too big, and he hacked it into something like a joke, so that was the end of that. A shy person so raised by the occasional leap beyond shyness that years pass before she can smooth the bodice of her dress down with both hands, at last convinced being ridiculous is not what they could accuse her of. Shyness, not reserve. The reserved have less to fear of what comes next. The meadows, the shepherds discoursing on the fitness of the lobby of the Pierre for their upland bivouacs. The reserved not only sidestep facts, but deal in forms the shy find beneath them, scattered about underfoot, common. There is a kind of sub-theme of um, climate apocalypse that runs through the book. And this is one of the uh, sonnets on that theme. It's called Snapshot. Because the needle at the top of the Chrysler building is visible now and then under white caps, slightly more of the Empire State pokes up like a buoy. A coral garden central park dreaming at the bottom Every shipwrecked cabin bus, noble in its sacrifice. None but ethical barnacles tackle the struts of the Brooklyn Bridge while hedonists lap the, sleep wa the sweet water still trapped in the pipes of Harlem walk-ups. How pleased is the subway to lose the distinction of being alone in being under everything. This is called Vertical. Um, it begins in New York and then it veers, <clears throat> it veers into Dublin where I spent um, a year and a half right after university in my 20s. And then it sort of veers back to New York. Vertical. A stop late, sure. But who gets off the train a stop early? You did. Your mind did it, as if to clear space for some new arrangement. Miss it, and the knot leashing you to a place tightens. Disembarking one stop shy raises the question of whether you plan to proceed. As the man said, whither do you follow your eyes so fast? Just walk and let the city's map draw you elsewhere, somewhere else within it. Rarely did I enter thus into collaboration, so cold it seemed to surprise myself. I consider it a measure of the distance, far be it from me, the idea of going away had gone. Name me a city as bullying as this one. Low, mean, drizzling Dublin kept a grip on her boys but let them go, all but heaved them out. I'm allowed to feminize Dublin because I lived there too. She's a friend, a friend I avoid. 
mean as in low and done, the finest avenues, the emptiest and dingiest, endless wet radials sending out one long Georgian pile, never thinking to plant a tree or incorporate a cafe, Carpet in, carpeted in the candy wrappers of English chocolate bars blown among chestnuts when a sudden gust brings back the sun for 10 minutes, morning and evening. It too now shoots up panes in air, clenched in the teeth of cranes rearing at the mouth of the river, that rinky-dink river. You have to live somewhere, yes? The information of the city, any city, will submit to redaction for, yes, him financing the air up there, the shadow real estate. He throws up home on home on around the park, which grows a shade garden. The other way has always been so wide and long, one part of it will wait three days to hear it's been attacked and in effect is gone. Forming an ensemble, cities sing together in chains of handholders around the globe during the Cold War releasing their little fictions with consequences. Singing, you're free to try them on. The bigger the body clock, the stronger its pull, and cities' clocks eclipse the planets. That's how they get you, that building frenzy, each one avid, incorporating another's thought into her own in order to become more herself until the place is solid masonry. Cafes on all the streets, yes, it's one and the same cafe. You're welcome to step in it twice. Stay too long to afford to move. You're free, to, though, to jump off the bee before going too far, which is far enough. You have to steal away in the night while sleeping. This is another, um, another poem with a debt to Dublin. Um, it opens with a joke that I did actually hear in a Dublin bar long, long ago. Um, and it probably helps to know that, <clears throat> that the sequence of letters and numbers that I'll read a few lines in um, is the chemical formula for alcohol. It's called Bender. I think of this as, <laughs> I think of this fondly as my poem about the 1990s. I mean politically, not just um, in my own, <laughs> my own life. Bender. Cruising once in the North Sea, a mail boat sights a defection off, let us say, the port side. How long he froze there, a mystery. Medics couldn't help him. He wailed Eastern European noise. They held him down. Bilinguals made no sense of it till a chemist with Cyrillic passing by the, C the sick bay unfurled it. C2H6O. Following swigs of elixir, sailor lived. This found me in a pub in Dublin, my lady of the delay tactic, where, when it wasn't raining, a very fine mist gathered under umbrellas. Coat flung over my knees in that one window bed Pardon me. Coat flung over my knees in that one window bedsit. I turned the pages of Moby Dick, starving for what flared between Queequeg and, let us say, Ishmael. They'd done it, stirred, swaying wits as well as the mordantly dry Dubliners, out of history. Free to dabble in the arts, I'd come to learn about the international arts. An Irish decade and the West all over, was it? Makers manicuring lawns untroubled for once. Bygones watering begonias. I'm just in time to see what beauty is when it's at home. Oh, shipmates, on the starboard hand of every woe, there is a sure delight, and higher the top of that delight than the bottom of the woe is deep. For heavy traffic in that waterway, empathy is out of order. Take the stairs marked sincere interest, nothing fancy, just an appetite. But then look around a little. But then bestowing interest on what interests you. This is a crime. But then voracious was a look I loved. Is not the main truck higher than the Kelson is low? 
Now in the drink, it's the sermon stick, sticks, distilled of the wish, and then again the wish it were so. So I swallowed it. This is called Lady. Wherever she goes, the planes of horizontals wave at her their horizontal hands. The filth, furry sills of restaurant windows. The increasingly horizontal curves atop once red hydrants. It goes without saying the passing roofs of cabs and the little irregular ledges on their handles, far from spick and span call to her hands. They're confident she's too discreet to use them as the others do. Her hands restore. And other men and women, when their shapes move across, not up or down, there where they collect the motes that fill the air, these surfaces she scans, no more than scans. Is it out of habit, or has habit been turned and turned as on a spit into an appetite? Don't say the horizontals mean anything to her. They simply wait for her where others don't, like threats, but threats so ubiquitous they're comfortable waiting, like friends early to rendezvous. This is called Inwood, um, and it may help if I emphasize that Inwood is um, the neighborhood at the northernmost tip of Manhattan, and it's the only part of the island that wasn't completely raised in the 19th century to make way for the street grid. So it remains very hilly, and there's one particular um, very sort of humpy hill that forms Inwood Park in the middle of it. Inwood. That quiet time before sirens was a meadow of missed signals, except they weren't missed. They were extraneous. Noise. Corlear need not have blown his trumpet when he did by Stye Town, where my then friend lived. Had he not, that lowland's paradise of polyglots survived official neglect and rolled its carpet out into the vast scrub of the country. With the onset of sirens, I harbored these very specific longings for the hills of Manhattan. They were so strong, I couldn't budge them into a line of events like a package. So I'd think, what then, all overturned in subtle ways. My then friend, not enjoyed parquet floors, rent stabilized with a girl who ran a charity helping sick women find gently worn couture clothes. First, they assemble out of scarves a plausible figure of authority, then they try to shine for it. And studies show this to be crucial for survival, all the more so in the city. The appetite for that source of lights implicit in the thickening of undergrowth. This is why undergrowth's so comfortable, a relief, not a person in the round, although my first time there alone, its stillness was enough to breathe someone dangerous, a man was tailing me. It's thick with freedom from the transparent striving of the trees, so I kept going, even feeling I'd be cut down. That's how headlines are made, I thought, and kept going, knowing this had been thought prior to many headlines having been made. We'd broken up, and without planning it, I took the train to the northernmost stop, walked to the last remaining hill, and walked its spiraling walks up and down, taking a new kind of careless snapshot right and left, seeing with sudden candor, which is to unsee time. Distraught, released into the nick between before and after. The blank, busy pictures of nothing I took home then absorbed a form of regret I carried on past them and grew heavy. So dense they sank into one or another hard drive. It's years since I've seen them. I tack up their memory as if they were a reservoir I might dip into again, though how I'd bring it up without blanching and blunting, I don't know. It's as if my muteness were integral to the turbulence that brings new objects crashing on shore. And one day it struck me, what if I did nothing to 
to gloss the blankness, the chalk sound of effects undone or words fished from their glistening. So much rather stay mum. That's how I gather these keepsakes, a glacier strewing drumlins behind her. The things you're not yet equipped to say will not later find their voice, but reenact themselves in costumes of their own devising, portray their original forms while facing backwards to study the way it was. You'll be able to just make out their backs and the backs of their masquerades. And in that way, they shed the true development of time, collate the then and then into a stack of light, opaque glass brick I like to think of as description, dangerous brick. A sign that's what happened in your country is widening doubt that it happened at all, failing to put it into words, circulating, inducing the news, its tissue starts to decompose in indeterminate ways, which can't be done unless your mind, and every mind, as it was then, does the same. This is another one of the friend poems. It's, um, it's kind of an autobiogra autobiography in in, a, in the form of a list of friends. Starting when I was about six, I guess. Friend. Montaigne was right. Without the body's meddling, love is more thrilling. Yet from the start in elementary, what she did with it was far from irrelevant. Her jeans, mascara, rings, all articulate. And she was always so pretty. Claire Birchall of the yellow hair. The twins at my birthday party came out and told me I was unfair for only playing with her. I said I was sorry. I didn't care. Bev across the street who shielded me from Bridget, nightmare next door, not nothing. Then Bev in high school, who spared me the group disease, four or five girls forever demanding IDs for safe conduct. I broke up with her over God, she believed, one lunch hour and after that was alone. Then Jen in freshman year devoted and dumped me when I moved in with Jess in sophomore, who was it. That went on and on like family. Then Mary, then Mitzi, then Stephanie, how the names now overlap as if slackening, hardening, deaccessioning held out this form of gushing, self flattery, the rush of love's akin, but it's only the one I adore. Um, this poem goes to Rome, and it's called Santo Stefano Rotondo. It goes out to Stephen. <laughs> I was going to read it anyway, and then when I was rereading it this morning, I thought, oh, of course I have to read this time. Um, I think it helps to know that we're Rotondo. <laughs> Not quite uh, apt, but... <laughs> um, Santo Stefano Rotondo is a church in Rome that's entirely circular, and on the inside circular wall, it's covered with these mammoth frescoes of various Christian martyrdoms um, that are sort of famously grisly in their details. Come, walk this path between flapping tarps, holding back on either side construction sites, the way a bedsheet hides from her her labor when the scalpel's in it, come along behind one friend in front of another. Looking back, the path narrows, memory a scarce resource, and bends, takes on the gentle curve of the earth as if in the space of that city it were given your body to feel for itself the four inches up and four inches down per mile the planet swells. 
Come and look at the frescoes. They pucker with little logs. Each round end is red with a little gray circle in the center. On each horizon, belted from sea to sea, the dim awakening potential for something equally made from ignorance to rise up all of a sudden is forecast, and if to get to safety slowly, laboriously, circumstances draw the flip book of the city unbuttoning one building at a time until it stands revealed in grasses, slaves, with little jugs worth, little necks of red paint splashed among the pastures and meadows and symbolic birds and dewdrops everywhere red, then who am I to call it unconstructive? Um, the next poem is called Prepper. It uh, takes place on a cruise ship, technically, at the time of its writing, the largest commercial cruise ship that had been built, 18 decks high, um, called the Symphony of the Seas. Um, and it probably helps to know that one of Buster Keaton's movies called The Navigator um, imagines him and um, his female co-star all alone on a very large ship that they suddenly have to learn how to navigate just the two of them with no other crew members on board. Prepper. Fine. Cruise ships fail to dock on the Upper West Side. A special sort of hell takes shape on 18 decks when supplies run out. Decks so high off the rock of the waves, the impact gets them before they get the chance to drown. And the climbing wall, still there, receptive, testy as it says it is, gathers dust. There follow debates over whether we can drink and who has the right to the runoff from the genuine skating rink. To make it paradise, you'd wanted ocean there, everywhere, just put down, put in its place with a giddy violence that then redounds on you when things go south, and that too you imagine you embrace. Some things, the philosopher said, are up to us, and others are not. Since he said so, how the spectrum has stretched or grown dense with things. Up to us are... Now sit and map the probabilities. Fire or ice, you won't be required to choose. You want to learn to play both sides to prove the self, prove that although it partakes of existence, it also exists. Should the western edge of the Atlantic hold the, wet, the eastern edge, where France meets Hungary, may yet do a little dance of erosion to prove you among the vineyards and the vicious, impenitent weasels. They, like creatures of the deep within their rows of waves, slithering and silver, have every right to be seen and feared before the waves crash over them. Fear, you see, is a kind of love. It's all you need. It's nothing like this creeper gumming up the wheels of the Corolla on our private drive. What the daylights, as well as the high beams, make of all roads and all forks in the roads. Appian Way, Autobahn. Those folks' wildest dreams, too, were escape routes. But to man the symphony of the seas, her 18 decks alone, with maybe a girl in evening dress waking on board, that takes vision. is called Shades. <laughs> the island trumpets these feelingly elongated gravestones. Slabs perforated with windows and workers, hollow, available. You can enter any building now, and lunchtime hypothesized our bodies being one, 
partaking of a single bolt of material, much the way the clockwork symptoms of a virus argue against your uniqueness, though you groaned uniquely, did you? Even so, the nature of your relation to chance was a thing you couldn't know unless things were really very irreversible. And though you couldn't, you named it, dressed it up or down, oppressed by the depth of your knowledge, archeologist of your own actuarials in exile. Hearth fires burned in the squares of windows closed to you all afternoon till the sun went down into Jersey. How entitled not to feel nettled you felt, how lonely, how cozy. Um, I'm going to read a couple of the Sybil poems. This is the first one, Sybil. I held a case. Sixth Avenue rewarded with a name for that undoing. Walking up, you turn left for west and right for east. That's all the map there'll be then. Unfollow me. One of the most boring avenues, but then, but then all the avenues as a whole are more because the streets are briefer, more self-possessed. Remember? I held a case. It was pre-war. I carried it onto the avenue of the Americas. I went for coffee. This doesn't chronicle the time I went in one of the dozen identical cafes on 6th, so you can take my word for it. So you can take my word for it. I also am all about abjuring abstraction. I wasn't about to hand it off to anyone, not even you. Listen, I'm no messenger. This is another of the Sybil poems, which began oddly with um, my reading or rereading some essays by Václav Havel. So <laughs> the details as they pertain to this uh, imaginary Sybil are actually of a Czech dissident um, during the Cold War, or some of the details. Sybil. The officers wear plain clothes for weeks then unannounced for months, will dress in uniform. I assume this is intended to keep me in suspense as to the nature of the structure of authority among them, two of them keeping their distance and one walking beside me, a little behind, always talking into his walkie-talkie to the two. It was the one, not the two that time, joining me in the sauna with his walkie-talkie, sweating but still able to function. I kept my swimsuit on. I felt the molecules coming and going. The atmosphere of the sky is also called an envelope. Why they bother steaming it open to black out certain clauses is beyond me. No, they want to keep me in suspense as to their interference up to and including the moment I slice it open. Suspense. I've learned to let it hold me like a refuge. My margins have it in them to move backward and forward. I'll read two more short Sybil poems and then maybe one last one. That's it. Let's see. Sybil. Tonight's host, the city, second city for those of us, we graze. There's talk of problems distinguished by fine distinctions, finer than you'd find in other cities. Aren't these the friends you came for? Distinctions. And an amazing capacity for imagining more than there really is when that more helps William of Ockham show Zeno, nothing is a no-go. 
guests but containers of capital capacities, mingle, graze. Nowhere on earth, honestly, is the turf nipped to such a fine buzz of knowingness. One last Sybil and then one last poem. Sybil. I made another angry swipe at it, for I'd been told that anger didn't put it off. Disgust, it's antipasto. Insult, a starch it loaded with various chutneys. Was only following the script to amp that seer's eyeshadow when it hit me as riddles it scribbled on fallen leaves were tossed up by the hottest breeze that only a poet would make the tree oak. Those lobes, those tines would hardly fit a syllable and felt so close to one who'd plant such little jokes, an orchard ripening around the pits while the seer sits inside a stone and stuffs her face with it. And this is the last poem. Thank you all for being such a lovely audience and coming out. It's called Dip. <clears throat> I thought of you, then called you, each of us reclining in our childhood basement. Then I came over, and your face was smaller, more crowded, not because of the two pairs of glasses with transparent frames, the bigger riding on top of the smaller, which I told myself was fine. And you were taking off your clothes, even the tights under your jeans, which I told myself was fine. They were sheer. So I tried on the old feeling of being thrown in the shade of your vast imagination. You were knocking small objects out of your ear with your phone. And I did feel, was it pity? Then with you on top, I gathered your sweat in my hands and thought, oh, I cannot do this again, which would hurt you so didn't stop you. Then your mom walked by like she used to, without judgment. She turned into the ocean, and I thought, as I was waking up, I'll take a dip. <laughs>